Hello and welcome to Tonight at 8 from the RSGB. Now if you're like me, at first thought microwave communications might seem like something very complex which only experienced amateurs with specialised knowledge and equipment can use. But as our guest tonight will show, microwaves are something which almost any amateur can access and experiment with. So it's a very warm welcome to Neil Underwood, G4LDR. Neil, good evening. Good evening, David, and good evening everyone who is uh, watching at the moment. Um, yes, I mean, um, I've got no professional background in uh, electronics or um, RF. So um, uh, when I started out on microwaves, it was all um, very, very new to me. And I've gradually learned over the years that um, uh, what you can do. And hopefully I should share some of those um, uh, things with you t tonight. And uh, you certainly don't need to be uh, an expert in uh, microwave in, um, uh, RF engineering. Great. Uh, back to you then, David. Yeah, well, we're really looking forward to it. And before Neil's presentation, a reminder that if you're watching this on Monday, the 1st of February, then this is live. And you can ask questions and add comments on either BATC or YouTube at any time during the presentation or straight afterwards. Please include your first name and call sign if you have one within the message. Also, please note that you can make this video stream fill your screen on most devices, usually by double clicking on the picture or pressing the full screen button. But now it's time to go back to Neil and find out how to get started on the microwave bands. Right, thank you, David. Um, yeah, starting out on uh, microwaves. Um, it was many years ago when I started on microwaves and it was in the days of uh, wide band on three centimeters. In fact, I built um, the uh, Practical Wireless XC system, which has been published a few years earlier. Um, and um, unfortunately, it was just about the time that everybody else was moving to narrowband. But I did manage to have a, a couple of contacts on the, um, the um, uh, uh, wideband uh, FM equipment um, uh, before uh, I started making the migration to uh, narrowband with everybody else. So um, as way of introduction, this is what I'm going to be covering tonight. Um, uh, what are the microwave bands? and um, you know, um, propagation uh, on, on microwaves. I'll talk a bit about uh, equipment uh, requirements and examples of um, some typical equipment that uh, you might uh, be able to acquire or buy. Um, and then um, give some information on um, operating on the um, microwave bands and there's some, uh, some few aids to uh, um, uh, operating which um, uh, are, are very useful. Um, and I'll talk about perhaps a little bit about um, um, uh, contest. Um, and also um, uh, at the end, I'll give a, uh, a few slides on the, res uh, the resources that are available to um, help you get going on the microwave bands. So microwave bands, well, these are really the um, amateur bands with frequencies greater than 1000 megahertz or one, one uh, gigahertz. Uh, I'm going to be covering the, um, the five bands uh, up to three centimeters, and that's up to 10.5 gigahertz. There's the 23 centimeter band, 13 centimeter band, nine centimeter band, six centimeter band, and the three centimeter band. And uh, as you can see, um, not all the bands are continuous. But there are some observations that uh, you can see. The amount of bandwidth that's available um, uh, to uh, uh, people who operate on the uh, microwave band, vastly exceeds uh, the bandwidth available at uh, HF and um, UHF um, and VHF bands. And as you can, can see, the, uh, the red band there on the slide is the uh, bandwidth we have available at microwaves and uh, the green and blue for um, uh, VHF and uh, HF. So um, a lot of bandwidth to play with. Um, we um, don't actually have primary use of or access to any of the microwave bands. We do share it with other services. For example, the 23SEMS uh, band is shared with radio location, things like uh, GPS, Galileo in particular, um, and the MOD. Uh, we share our bands with the MOD uh, and, and, and other government um, departments. And there are some restrictions, particularly on the 13 centimeter band, uh, where if you're going to operate on part of the band, the, the normal narrow band uh, uh, center of operation, you'll need to um, 
um, uh, fill out a form to uh, let Ofcom know uh, that you operate so that if they need to get in contact with you, um, they can. It's because we share the, um, that part of the ban with the MOD these days. And there are also some geographical restrictions on thir uh, th uh, 13 centimetres. Um, for instance, um, I live uh, within a few miles of Boscombe Down Airfield, and uh, I'm not allowed to operate on the 13 centimetre band uh, during daylight hours um, on office days um, between May and October. I can operate at any time on the weekends or any time during uh, uh, the winter months, but, but not during the summer, summer months. So um, all um, uh, classes of license have access to the microwave bands. The foundation license only has access to the, uh, to the part of the um, three centimeter band and um, a power limit there of one watt, whereas it, on the HF and VHF bands, um, uh, the uh, foundation licensees can use 10 watts. Um, and the other restriction, of course, is that they can only use um, commercial transmit uh, kit. Um, said only one watt, but one watt to a 60 centimeter diameter dish, which is, has, you're gonna have a, a gain of at least 30 dBi, actually equates to one kilowatt ERIP. So still quite a, a lot of uh, power going out in, uh, but, but in a very narrow beam. Um, the intermediate license had access to, all, uh, to parts of all the bands uh, with the uh, 50 watt limit and of course the advanced license has access to uh, all parts of the microwave bands with uh, a power limit of 400 watts. Um, that's if you can generate that amount of power, <laughs> um, gets, uh, can get, get very expensive, particularly at, um, at the higher frequencies. So microwave propagation is only line of sight. Well, it is line of sight, but not only line of sight. Um, some of the propagation modes that are evident at VHF and UHF bands are also um, um, available for contacts on the, um, the microwave bands. For, for, for example, tropospheric uh, scatter, tropospheric duct ducting, aircraft scatter. But what you won't do is iron scatter. So you won't be bouncing microwave signals off the aurora. Uh, off, off uh, meteor uh, uh, trails um, or uh, sporadic E. Um, in addition, you've got some additional um, uh, um, uh, uh, mo uh, modes of uh, propagation. Um, certainly at uh, three centimeters and, and, and uh, some of the other bands, you get um, uh, rain scatter. Um, and um, you can actually find uh, that um, you can actually bounce signals off um, suitably located uh, towers and masts. Um, we, uh, there's a few of us in this area that we, uh, we've got a common sort of <laughs> scatter point um, that allow us to um, uh, communicate even with our narrow dishes uh, with, uh, between the group by just uh, bouncing it off. Um, we're not sure what, but it's possibly a power line towers um, or um, a, a phone mast or something like that. Um, uh, in one particular di direction and the scatter off that, we can all hear each other. Okay, monitoring microwave propagation. Um, the um, uh, microwave bands um, uh, do, um, uh, are not, uh, signals are not <laughs> always very strong um, and you need some uh, uh, indication that the bands are gonna be open and um, Across uh, Western Europe uh, and uh, elsewhere in the world, come to that, there are um, uh, microwave beacons and uh, quite an extensive net network uh, in, um, in, in uh, Europe as well as the UK. So we're, we're very lucky in this part of the world. Um, I'll just play, hopefully this will play, um, um, uh, a video clip. Hope you're hearing that. Uh, that was the uh, GB3 SCC six centimeter be beacon uh, in Dorset. I'm located near Salisbury in Wiltshire, and that beacon is um, uh, 60, uh, uh, sorry, 50 kilometers away. 
So uh, very strong. Um, is, uh, the time I recorded it, I think it was about S7 or S8. Um, the three centimeter beacon from the same site uh, can be uh, even stronger at times. Um, you can find the details of the beacons um, um, by looking at the RSGB website um, or the RSGB yearbook, although some of the data, I must say, is a little bit out of date now. Uh, but for um, up-to-date information on the uh, beacons uh, 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 around the UK and, and uh, in Europe, um, uh, go to uh, the Beacon Spot site. I'll give you um, email, uh, uh, sorry, uh, web addresses, etc., at the end of the presentation, um, where you uh, not only can list all the information on uh, the various beacons, but uh, you can also see when they were heard and who heard them. So um, that's a very useful resource. Um, beacon Spot, as you can see, um, you can list the um, beacons as a map or you can have them as a straightforward uh, list uh, for each of the bands. Um, and if you click on one of the um, uh, pins on the map, uh, you will get up the uh, information on that particular um, uh, beacon. And uh, I've clicked on um, uh, GB3 SCK, uh, SCX rather, down in Dorset. And that uh, tells me it's 50 kilometers away, it gives me the heading, uh, gives me the output power of the, uh, the beacon. And um, at the bottom there, I could even click on uh, uh, um, a link that will show me the, the last 50 uh, times it was heard. And um, uh, it looks like uh, it's probably too small to, uh, to see, but um, um, G0 API has been spotting the, um, the beacon quite a lot um, recently. So that, uh, that covers, as I say, a lot of uh, um, Western Europe. Um, beacons tend to be uh, located on high spots. Um, on the uh, 23 centimeter uh, beacon um, at, um, uh, uh, near Ipswich, it's actually located on uh, that tower in the, top uh, in the photograph at the top, which is part of the um, BT Research Labs um, at Marshalsham. And um, on the right-hand side, that's the, um, the mast uh, and the setup at uh, Bell Hill in Dorset, which has uh, beacons from 13 centimeters up to 47 gigahertz. So that's a very useful resource. Of course, these beacons don't, uh, they don't, uh, they do cost <laughs> a lot to maintain. Um, so um, uh, 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 beacon groups uh, are always looking for uh, donations. So moving on, let's have a look at some of the um, equipment requirements to, uh, to get us going on the microwave bands. Well, uh, we could go out and buy a microwave transceiver, or we could use uh, an HF, VHF or UHF transceiver with a transverter, or, and um, fairly recently, this, this uh, second, um, uh, last one is microwave SDRs, um, transceiver coupled to a low, with a low cost um, computer, such as a Raspberry Pi. Um, but you'll also need other items. Uh, you need an antenna, you'll need a, some low loss coax uh, or waveguide to connect the uh, transceiver or transverter to the antenna. And you may um, also need filters to make sure you're not radiating any outer band um, energy. Um, you'll also need uh, or possibly need preamplifiers and power amplifiers. So um, there's a number of bits and pieces that you need to get together. Commercial transceivers. Um, they are only available for 23 centimeters. And as far as I know, the ICOM IC9700 is the only available um, transceiver that you can go in and buy. It has 23 centimeters and that's got 20, uh, 10 watts output. Of course, it also covers two meters and 70 cents. Um, but there is more choice on the second hand market. There are, um, there are transceivers such as the IC9100 or the IC910 if they're fitted with uh, 23 cents modules. Um, there's um, somewhat older, there's the Yaesu 736, uh, or um, um, there's the Kenwood TS 
2000X, which is um, proved very popular, I think, uh, or but the, um, the, the um, all those have proved very popular with um, satellite operators. And there's just a, a picture of some of the uh, commercial transceivers uh, available um, that you might uh, might see advertised uh, either as uh, secondhand at dealers or um, possibly on uh, internet uh, auction sites. Or rallies, of course, once we're allowed to have rallies again. Um, transverses with uh, HF or VHF and UHF transceiver. Um, this is currently the most popular option for all the microwave bands. Um, commercial transceivers, and the transceiver really translates um, uh, a VHF or an HF uh, signal up to the microwave band or, um, or um, uh, down converts for a uh, for receive. Um, there are several manufacturers. There's Kuhn Electronic in Germany. There's SG Labs in um, Bulgaria. Um, down East Microwave uh, in the US. Um, and they're all keen to, to sell to you. Um, and there's an example of uh, some commercial transceivers. On the left is the SG Labs 23 cents transverter. And on the, uh, the right is the Kuhn three centimeter transverter. That's the, the latest version. I think that's um, um, uh, the fifth generation uh, of, uh, of transverter that um, uh, Kuhn have uh, uh, sold. And that's, that only came out, came onto the market um, a few months ago. Um, the other option is transverter kits or PCBs. Um, and kits or, or transverters or kits to, um, uh, uh, tend to be uh, a cheaper option to get going. Um, but if you're going to build a kit, uh, it's going to involve small surface mount components. So you're going to need um, some experience of building with uh, small components. And you'll probably need some test gear or at least access to some test gear to get it going. I remember when I uh, first got going on narrowband uh, uh, microwave band uh, and, and had to build all my own kit. Uh, kits were made available by Charlie G3WDG in those days back in the, the 90s. The only bit of test gear I had was a multimeter, and um, that's how I was able to uh, tune up um, my receiver, my uh, tran uh, transmit uh, modules, and, and got them going that way. And I did find that eventually a, um, uh, a power meter for um, the three centimeters, which uh, which also came in very useful, but um, you don't necessarily need a lot of test gear. Um, some suppliers of uh, kits are um, Danny's uh, Microwave in the US and Mini Kits in Australia. Though, <laughs> as of yesterday, I saw posting to say that Mini Kits were no longer selling to the UK because following Brexit and the uh, changes in um, uh, our tax laws, um, they were unable to sell to us. I hope that's only a temporary measure. Um, but there we are. That's uh, um, one of the consequences. And, uh, and also we find that uh, things are taking a bit longer to, uh, to get to people these days. Um, the other option is to build your own. Um, you, if you're really clever, you could design your own transverter. Um, but there are printed circuit boards available. Um, and again, unfortunately, um, uh, there's just been a, um, uh, um, uh, some printed circuit boards ordered for um, uh, French design. And I think the, uh, the order for that closed uh, a few days ago, uh, which is a bit unfortunate. Anybody thinking following this um, presentation, they might go down the um, build it yourself route with uh, just buying a printed circuit board. Um, Examples of uh, the Mini Kits 23 Sems transverter um, only outputs a few milliwatts. Um, I'm not sure what 10 or 100 milliwatts, perhaps. Um, and on the um, on the right, there's the uh, F6 BVA uh, 3 Sems trans uh, transverter. Um, and I've, uh, for the fun of it, I've uh, I've ordered a, a pretty circuit board, and uh, because I now have to go in there. Uh, order all the components that I, I need for it and the box and the connectors and everything else. But it'll be fun to, to build. I haven't uh, built one, built a 
three cents transverter since the 1990s. Okay, the actual basic transverter is only part of the system. You will need other, um, uh, other bits and pieces. Um, you might need a local oscillator, but your transverter may well have uh, a local oscillator built in. Um, you may need antenna switching. Again, the transverter may have its internal antenna switching between receive and um, um, transmit. Uh, you might want a power amplifier because um, most transverters only give milliwatts output. Some of them give the odd watt, but you might want uh, a bit more power. Um, you also might want um, a low noise amplifier. Um, uh, it it uh, can be very uh, useful uh, in um, improving um, received performance, although quite a lot of the um, transverters available do have very good receivers. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you're probably going to need uh, filters. Uh, if they're not built into the trans transverter, then you're going to need some external filters to um, make sure that um, uh, there's no outer band uh, uh, radiation. Um, and also, if you're going to use it outside, um, you'll need to put it in a, a, water, a waterproof box. And you'll also need uh, connections to your IF radio, both for RF drive and uh, receive, and also, of course, to, to um, um, uh, synchronise the um, uh, switching um, between the transverter and your radio using the press to talk line. And of course, you'll need a connection to an antenna. And that's just the, uh, the basic building blocks um, of uh, a trans, uh, transverter based uh, system. Um, so you've got the IF radio transverter. As I said, you may or may not need a, an LO. Um, you may or may not want the PA or preamp, uh, but you'd probably, uh, unless it's built in, you'll need um, um, an RF uh, um, TX RX switching. And of course, you'll need an antenna and something to connect your antenna to the transverter. And this is not a very tidy, as far as the DC wiring is concerned, um, three SEMS transverter, it's my trans transverter, and you can see the uh, component parts. There's the, um, on the right hand side is the, um, uh, is the transverter itself. Um, and I've modified that to take a uh, external local oscillator, which is uh, in itself is, um, uh, linked to a, a reference frequency. So um, that uh, is capable of holding um, uh, the frequency within a few hertz uh, at 10, uh, 10 gigahertz. So we're talking about better than 10 to the 9 uh, stability, uh, 1, in 10 to my, 1 in 10 to the 9 uh, frequency uh, uh, stability. Um, You've also got, uh, uh, I've also got a preamplifier, um, which is bolted directly to the waveguide switch. And at the bottom of the picture is uh, a power amplifier. Um, and that system I built about um, 12 years ago, and it spent um, the whole of that 12 years up on my tower. Um, so uh, it survived uh, um, 10 year, uh, 12 years of use and uh, all the weather that we've had in the, uh, the meantime. Um, in order to, uh, to use your transverter, you will need um, an IF transceiver. Now, um, the frequency obviously should be uh, uh, the same as the uh, uh, frequency that the transverter requires. So that might be uh, uh, an IF frequency of 28 megahertz, one four four. Uh, 432 and probably one, one, uh, 144 and 432 are the most common uh, IF frequencies used uh, these days. Um, obviously the power level will need to be compatible with the, um, uh, the input power requirements of the transverter. Um, so um, they can, uh, it's usually uh, a few milliwatts up to, to a watt. So uh, if you've got a trans transceiver, which has got an output of 100 watts and you can't reduce that power, um, the, you would not want to uh, connect that to the transverter. It would last milliseconds. Um, and also, of course, you need to, uh, the, the uh, transceiver needs to have um, a means of um, uh, providing an output of your PP, a PTT line uh, to switch your tra uh, transverter from transmit to receive. 
Um, some examples of some common IF transceivers. Um, there's the FT290 uh, Mark I shown here. Um, very old. I've got one, um, and they date back from uh, um, the um, uh, early 1980s. So um, you know they're coming up to 40 years old. And um, uh, if you're thinking of buying a, a second-hand one, um, make sure it works because um, there are problems with them. Um, and I was astounded yesterday when I happened to look online to see what the price. I bought mine a few years ago, second hand, £50 at a rally. Um, they're now three times that on eBay. Uh, um, I guess it's a, it's a, a seller's market. Um, uh, there's also the FT790, the um, 432 makes uh, version, but that's uh, not as common. Um, a lot of people are using FT. 817s or the FT818 as they are now, um, that uh, provides uh, IF outputs of um, 28144 and uh, 432 megs uh, if you want them. Um, as I say, you could uh, use any UHF or U uh, UHF uh, base station, but take care of the power. Um, or again, um, any uh, you know top of the range uh, HF radio with a using it all as a, a 28 megs IF. Um, as long as it's got a low-level um, transmit output, and a lot of the, the expensive uh, uh, rigs uh, do, I believe. There is another alternative to transverters and transceivers, um, which is um, proved um, uh, popular in uh, parts of the country, sort of around Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham sort of areas, and that's the use of um, low-power FM-only systems for um, six centimetres. Um, these are based on the first person video uh, systems. Um, these are the, uh, the, um, the video uh, transmitters and receivers that are used with drones for, uh, amongst other things. And although they are intended for video, um, they can be used for uh, FM vo uh, voice with uh, suitable uh, modulation. And it just so happens that one of the uh, preset uh, channels of FPVs um, uh, overlaps with part of our uh, six centimeter band. Um, uh, so um, a system uh, that's based on FPVs can um, uh, result in a uh, system when coupled with a suitable antenna, which will be at least capable of line of sight paths. Um, and I think over a hundred kilometers have been um, achievable hilltop to hilltop in the, uh, the Northwest of, uh, uh, of England. Um, I'm not sure, you might might get to cross town uh, depending on um, obstructions, but um, being a, being a, a wideband FM system, um, you know, they're not going to uh, propagate too well um, uh, uh, into valleys or uh, if there's uh, too many obstructions in the path. And that's uh, some pictures of a, a FPV system, the bits and pieces on the top uh, left. Um, you can buy for probably under 30 pounds. You need to couple that with a changeover relay for um, transmit to uh, receive um, um, and um, obviously uh, an antenna, either a small dish or um, a flat panel uh, antenna on the uh, right hand side. And there um, uh, the, uh, the person that uh, built that has done away with the need for RF switching, he's, uh, he's got two antennas, one for receive and one for transmit. Another approach uh, um, that's uh, available to us nowadays um, is um, software-defined radio. Now, SDRs with uh, receivers that cover up to about two gigahertz have been available for a few years. Um, these include the very popular uh, FunQ Fun Cube dongle and others like the SDR Play or as a Hack RF. Um, and you can use them together with, uh, for ex example, a um, uh, satellite, satellite TV down converter, LNB, um, to extend the range, uh, for example, to uh, listen to the three centimeter band. In fact, that's what most people who operate through Oscar 100 do. Um, they, they have an LNB and, um, and, and uh, an SDR. Uh, 
fairly re it's only fairly recently in the last 18 months couple of years i suppose that um uh sdr is capable both receive and transmit um have been uh, become available certainly at a, um, a, a price that amateurs can, can afford and these uh, include the lime sdr and the Ablum pluto um, you'll require um, a pc when running these um, and also suitable software such as um, um, the uh, sdr uh, console um, and an even newer development has been um, the um, uh, a system uh, that's called the Langston, and it's uh, based on a, a Raspberry Four, a Raspberry Pi uh, Four, um, and it's uh, been developed by Colin G4 EML uh, as an ex uh, experimental SDR TX RX system. As I say, it's based on a Raspberry Four, Raspberry Pi Four, and a Pluto SDR. And it's got coverage of VHF, UHF, and microwave frequencies, and will cover uh, 70 megahertz. So you've got the four meter band up to six gigahertz, high up to the um, six centimeter band. Um, uh, once you've done the frequency extension hack, which is uh, a few lines of uh, code that have have to be um, um, uh, sent to the uh, Pluto. Um, the, um, the other requirements you will need, of course, again, output filtering, very important with uh, these SDRs, particularly the, the, uh, the Pluto. Um, being a wideband uh, um, uh, transmit device, um, it's got virtually no filtering of its own. Um, and uh, if you try to use it without a filter, it's going to have um, sproggies uh, all, all the way uh, up the microwave bands, which we're not going to be popular with. Um, other users of the band, and of course, some of those um, sproggies will come out, uh, um, uh, come out uh, right where uh, you don't want them. Uh, oh, please. Oh, sorry. When I expect, when I mean sproggies, I mean um, um, uh, uh, frequency uh, uh, outputs from your um, um, uh, harmonics from your um, transmitter. Uh, that um, uh, you know, you get the. Um, the uh, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so on. Har oh, har harmonic. So, okay. um, yeah. Sorry, I've sort of. That's using, all right. Uh, <laughs> that's all right. Thank you for that. <laughs> okay. Um, you need you also need band switching and power amplifiers and uh, uh, receive uh, low noise amplifiers for, um, uh, to make a system, just as you would with a, a conventional transverter. Hmm. Um, and there on the uh, the left is um, the. Um, uh, uh, Langston um, system in uh, not not boxed up, very much like my system is at the moment. Uh, and below it is someone has um, um, uh, very nicely uh, put theirs in a, in a box. Um, and um, uh, also the BATC, uh, their port, uh, latest version of the ports down their digital amateur television transmitter. Um, uh, will actually run the Langston once you've uh, downloaded the, um, the, um, the, uh, the the suitable software to the uh, uh, to the system running uh, uh, ports down uh, transmitter. Um, and if this is going to work, hopefully it will work. Um, I'll just click on the. This is a little bit of video I shot um, the other day out of the shack window. Um, the Pluto is just sitting on the uh, the windowsill. And that was uh, a beacon on the Isle of Wight. Um, it's about uh, 50 kilometers from, uh, from where I am. Uh, good path, actually, um, not much in the way. Uh, and that was the, um, the Pluto, just with its little, um, um, as supplied little stubby antennas receiving uh, 23 sends over. Um, I don't know how much the uh, power of the beacon runs, just a few watts, so um, it just shows um, how sensitive the Pluto is. Um, I can actually receive two other um, uh, 23 cents beacons on the Pluto, um, uh, but uh, not such a, a good str uh, strength because um, they're over more difficult uh, paths. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I meant to 
on to the next slide. Right, power amplifiers. Um, yes, if you want to, to boost your power of your transverter, then um, um, you'll need to, uh, to uh, add on a, a power amplifier. Um, there are uh, commercial power amplifiers available. Um, I'm told that SG Labs in Bulgaria do a very nice um, 25 watt amplifier for 23 sems to go with their um, 23 sems amplifier. Kuhn Electronics in uh, Germany do um, um, amplifiers for all the uh, microwave bands at various power levels. And you can uh, often uh, find um, uh, power amplifiers available um, via internet sites uh, and auction sites. And also uh, there are kits available. Um, this uh, example at the bottom is a, a, low, power, a low power kit um, designed and um, available from G4BAO. Um, I think it gives a few watts on, um, uh, on uh, uh, 23 SEMs and can be used to um, go between your uh, transverter, which may only be a few milliwatts output, uh, uh, and uh, go between that and uh, a bigger power amplifier if you wanted uh, more power. Um, X commercial power amplifiers. Um, these are um, sometimes available at uh, on internet sites or um, rallies around tables. Um, there's several types available for nine centimeters, uh, such as Ionica, Franti, and St uh, Stealth microwave. Um, and um, these can have power levels um, typically 15 watts, uh, up to 50 watts, some of them, uh, depend on the, the model number. So you can be careful what, uh, which ones you, you purchase. Um, there are lots of um, two gigahertz or thereabouts X mobile uh, phone base station amplifiers uh, available um, uh, on the, um, the surplus market. Um, uh, for 13 uh, uh, SEMs um, with um, uh, power levels up to uh, 400 watts. There's quite a few at, uh, available at 50 watts. And a lot of people are using these for um, uplinking, providing um, uplink uh, power uh, for Oscar 100. Um, but uh, be warned, not all of them um, tune to um, um, uh, 2.3 gigahertz. Um, um, a couple of years ago, I was given, um, I think about, so I'm just looking down at the pile on the floor, <laughs> about six of these uh, X commercial amplifiers, and um, only two can I make to uh, to give get, get uh, give power out on the 13 centimeter band. Um, and sometimes there are amplifiers available for other bands. Driving power amplifiers. Um, it's uh, important not to overdrive. Um, power amplifier, not to put too much power into it, because as I say, we do share our uh, bands with other users, so um, uh, we don't want to make um, the bands unusable for others or even other amateurs, uh, especially when there's a, a lot of activity like during contest or, or openings when, the, when conditions are good. And um, don't forget, some of the commercial, uh, um, X commercial amplifiers have very high gains. Um, for example, one milliwatt in will give 400 watts out, so you don't have to be putting uh, uh, more than a, a milliwatt in, otherwise you will uh, start uh, causing uh, all, um, lots of harmonics and spreading of signals. Transmitter and filter, as I say, very important. Um, uh, low pass filters, certainly in the um, transmit line, and there are many designs. But um, you might also uh, be having trouble um, on the receive side, um, particularly from uh, nearby, nearby uh, mobile phone uh, base stations on the 13 centimeter band, because they're only a, um, a, a few hundred uh, uh, megahertz away from us. So um, you might find that you might need some uh, band pass, pass uh, filtering, or um, I guess possibly even some notch filters on the, the uh, interfering frequency but um um because uh, that that doesn't apply to us all preamplifiers um good preamplifier can enhance your um received performance um uh tremendously and particularly um on the higher frequencies um when you have um uh, a, a long uh, cable runs and uh, you've got uh, a, a lot of loss in your your cables 
Um, now, the preamplifier should be um, um, uh, positioned as close as the amplifier as possible. And this, uh, this uh, means you'll get best uh, system noise uh, perf uh, figure performance. Um, it's no good having uh, the preamplifier next to the rig in the shack if you've got uh, 30 meters of um, not very good coax to the antenna. Um, uh, it is important, particularly if you're running any sort of power, is to make sure you have proper sequencing of the um, RX TX changeover. You don't want to risk putting power up into the uh, into the preamplifier. It's not going to last very long. Um, I mentioned losses in cable. It's important to um, make sure that you uh, uh, use a uh, a good cable, good coaxial cable at microwave frequencies. Those that are useful at the lower frequencies, HF, VHF, for instance, have far too much loss at microwave frequencies. So UR67 or RG213 at uh, two meters has a loss of 0.09 dBs per meter. When you go up to the six centimeter band, that figure goes up by a factor of 10. So 0.9, nearly a dB loss per, per meter. So. For a typical run of um, uh, RG213, and if you're really rich and you just bought a, um, a six meter, uh, sorry, six centimeter, 100 watt amplifier, uh, and you connect that to, to the 20 meter of coax, uh, you'll find that you only get about 1.25 watts output to the antenna. So you just wasted an awful lot of money, basically. Um, so you, Good quality um, cables often available at um, rallies or you can find on auction auction sites. And if possible, get get the um, get the um, uh, secondhand uh, coax uh, with uh, connectors already on them because uh, connectors can be quite expensive. Antenna, I guess with any amateur band, the antenna is uh, the most important part of the system. It's the only part of the system that will give you gain. Uh, without providing any external power, both on uh, transmit and receive, and more importantly on receive. Um, and I think people will probably argue with me, but to a first <laughs> to, to a first principle, um, they are noiseless amplifiers, if you like, at um, uh, um, at any frequency. But um, um, and that that can be important, but uh, microwave frequencies. Um, we find that Yagi's are usually used at 23 sems, uh, 13 sems. I guess 13 sems is usually the sort of transition point that uh, where some people use Yagi's, some people use um, dishes. Um, there are some designs for nine sems um, Yagi's, and uh, I guess there are probably few people use those. But um, by by nine sems, most people are using some sort of dish. Um, also, flat, flat panels are, um, sorry, I should have um, gone on to dishes. Um, there are two, basically, there are two types. There's the prime focus or offset. Um, um, the um, prime focus means that the, uh, the actual feed point is actually at the focus of the dish, and obviously with offset, it is offset from the prime focus. Um, the, there are usually plenty of ex-satellite TV dishes available, and these are usually um, uh, the offset type. Um, the old um, uh, sky dishes of various sizes. Um, and there's also um, some people use flat panel uh, antennas. Um, the one advantage of these is that they're relatively easy to make, um, but um, they generally do have um, uh, lower gains than um, Yagi's or dishes. And there's just some examples. Um, on the top right is, uh, on the top left, sorry, <laughs> is um, uh, a um, uh, homebrew Yagi for um, 23 sem, uh, sems. Then we've got um, prime focus dishes be below that, offset dish in the middle, and example, uh, which I've already shown this picture before, um, of uh, flat uh, panel um, antennas. So where to locate your system? Well, for the lower frequencies in the shack with um, uh, low loss cable is acceptable, um, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, having a mast head amplifier is um, will, will provide you with um, 
significant uh, ad advantage on receive. At the higher frequencies, I'm afraid you don't really have much it's choice but to put the, um, to put the transverter uh, up at uh, the masthead uh, as close to the antenna as possible, like right behind a dish, for instance. It does require to be put in a waterproof uh, enclosure. Um, and it's um, obviously when it is up there, it's more difficult to make adjustments or anything goes wrong. You need to get it back down off the roof or off the mast. Um, test equipment. I'm not going to spend uh, any time really talking about test equipment, um, other than to say that uh, recently uh, some very cheap test equipment has become available. Um, uh, very cheap um, compared with um, commercial test equipment, um, where you might be sp spending um, ten thousand pounds or twenty thousand pounds on a spectrum, a, a good spectrum analyzer, which will cover the higher microwave bands. Um, there's things like signal generators, uh, antenna analyzers, um, and nano VNAs, which I think there's a talk coming up, um, if not next month, um, uh, soon on the, on, on the Monday evening. Um, and then um, thinking something I only discovered fairly recently was that the Pluto SDR can also be used as a six uh, gigahertz um, spectrum analyzer. Uh, spectrum analyzer with tracking generator or uh, or, um, uh, or a signal generator. So it's um, a really useful um, bit of kit. Right, and the question now, operating. Do you operate fixed station uh, at home or do you want to go out portable? So there are a number of th factors that you need to uh, take into account when making, making a decision. Basically, your home location is it at the top of the hill or uh, valley bottom. Um, microwaves um, don't go over obstructions very well, um, particularly on the higher frequencies. Um, so um, if you do live in the bottom of a valley, you're either restricted to working up and down the valley um, or, um, or, or consider going out uh, portable. Um, and the bands you want to operate on, whereas you might be able to operate from a uh, um, uh, a not very good site on 23 cents, um, you probably wouldn't be able to on three centimeters. Um, there are exceptions, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, then, of course, the capability of the equipment. I mean, are you running uh, milliwatts or a few watts, or are you running a QRO? Um, it, it can make a difference. Of course, um, you do also need to, to balance your QR, QRO uh, power with the, with the fact that you need to be able to here are other stations who may not be running as much power as you. And then uh, propagation modes that you want to, to make, make use of. Um, if you want to, uh, if you're happy to uh, make use of uh, things like uh, aircraft scatter or rain scatter, um, then uh, operating from a non-optimum site um, uh, could, uh, could prove um, okay. Um, and then uh, what type of operation do you want to do? You just want to concentrate on terrestrial? Do you want to use uh, operate on satellites? Or the awesome bit, uh, EME. Um, we're living at the bottom of a valley. Um, uh, satellite and EME may not be, uh, may, may not be a problem. Neil, um, can I just stop you just for a moment there? EME, for those watching and just you know, never looked at the yep. subject before, can you just briefly explain what that means? Right, EME. Earth, Moon, Earth. I should have uh, should have put it in full. I apologise for that. That's uh, where um, uh, you bounce signals off the Moon. You point your antenna at the Moon, um, and uh, your signal gets bounced back off off the Moon, and you um, you make contacts with people potentially all over the world. Um, and um, it's um, you need uh, relatively high power. You need um, um, relatively big dish. Um, need good receive system, uh, and the signals are always going to be very, very weak. Um, the one big thing with EME now, of course, is uh, uh, the digital modes, which mean that even um, lower powered stations with smaller dishes or people have even done or even do EME uh, using single Yagis on uh, bands like 70 centimeters and 23 centimeters. So you don't necessarily need a a big system if you if you're going to uh, to um, to use digital modes. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. 
uh, and I could give a whole uh, talk on EME, and mm -hmm. so could others as well. Because that's one of my one of the, one of the other um, aspects of the hobby that um, I'm currently into. Okay, um, going back to the slide, when do you when do you want to operate? Do you want to operate in contests, um, or do you want to operate at any time of the night or day? So, uh, in the latter case, you probably want to be set up at home. And of course, if you do want to operate portable. Are there any portable sites, uh, the locations near your home that, you know, you don't really want to have to um, drive uh, 50 or 100 miles to uh, the nearest mountain uh, if you um, if you every time you want to operate. Operating portable. Um, now, uh, as I say, the, uh, the site needs to be accessible for a start. Uh, if you've got uh, a load of gear. Um, that you uh, want to operate with. Um, you don't want to have to carry that too far. And more importantly, it's going to have to be uh, clear of local obstructions. I live in an area in southern Wiltshire here where we've got various hills uh, around, but probably 90% of them have woods on the top. And that is absolutely useless for trying to operate on the microwave bands. You do need uh, to be able to uh, have a clear takeoff in the uh, in the directions you want to operate in. Um, but people do carry uh, microwave gear up uh, up uh, hills and um, um, mountains, um, and you can backpack with a, a small system, and um, you've got the advantage of um, having uh, long paths to work without uh, obstructions. Of course, you have to consider powering your equipment if you're going out portable. Um, if you're a really big sort of contest station, you've probably got generators, but um, for us uh, who want to go out to, uh, um, as an individual, you'll probably be taking some battery power with you. Um, make sure you've got the battery capacity to last the duration you're expecting to uh, to operate on. The number of times I've um, um, uh, come across stations and, and actually work them where, off, where clearly their battery <laughs> Voltage is dropping. Their signal is becoming very, very uh, distorted, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm quite happy to give a sig uh, signal report of two and nine to a signal that's uh, uh, where, where a station's signal is, <laughs> is unintelligible or almost anyway. Um, you also need some other things to consider. You need a means of supporting your antenna, so you need a stu sturdy uh, tripod or mast. Some of the cheap photographic type uh, tripods just won't do. They blow over and you risk damaging uh, your uh, your equipment. Um, if you're out on a hilltop, you'll meet, need um, means of calculating bearings. Um, so uh, uh, and also you need a, a compass to be able to uh, line your dish up because of the um, the high gain of the dishes that we use. Um, means that the beam width is very narrow so um, you generally have to be pointing uh, directly at the station you're trying to to work you'll also need some form of talk back and i'll come on to talk back a, a little later um, uh, so you'll either need a, a, a radio on a lower, lower frequency like two meters um, or a phone or a laptop um, uh, running a, um, a microwave chat such as on4kst which i'll come on to um, and also you need uh, paper log or logging software um, in order to uh, record your um, your laptop. And uh, if you're on top of a mountain, even in the summer, it can be really cold if it's uh, if the wind is blowing. So you need to need to think about things like warm clothing. Um, just a couple of pictures of um, um, uh, portable stations. The the one on the left, the two pictures on the left are um, G3 PIA. Um, in Oxfordshire, they're, um, uh, that's a uh, 23 cent centimetre contest station. Uh, and on, uh, on the right is the uh, portable setup of uh, G4GLT. Um, um, uh, he lives um, down in um, um, Devon, Somerset way. I'm <laughs> yeah, um, down that way. Um, so um, that's his three centimetre setup on a nice uh, tripod and a, a nice dish and feed. Right, operating, um, some aids to uh, um, operating. I mentioned talkbacks. Um, probably, just, except during contest and when they're really enhanced conditions, um, calling uh, CQ on the microwave bands isn't going to get you any contacts, I'm afraid. 
one of the reasons that I mentioned a moment ago is that antenna beam whips are, are very uh, uh, narrow on the microwave band. So the chance that you're actually pointing at somebody randomly uh, who is also pointing at you, not knowing you're there, um, is very, very unlikely. Um, and also in reality, um, no one actually listens on the microwave calling frequencies. I don't think anybody ever did. I mean, the good old days um, before um, internet, um, in order to um, uh, to provide uh, alert of uh, conditions, people used to have be on phone lists and people used to phone you up and say, oh, I'm just hearing a station from Germany. Why don't you come on the band? We don't need to do that anymore. Um, we've got the internet. Um, and also the only means of talk back in those days was, um, was two meters, um, so VHA. Um, so nowadays, virtually all, all microwave contacts um, are set up using um, the ON4 KST chat or uh, Zello, which is a press to talk uh, app that you can get on your phone, uh, or by arranging a um, contact on a VHF UHF band. Um, now, um, some of the uh, problems of K or one of the problems of KST is when it's busy, when conditions are good and um, uh, or during contest, um, the actual uh, information window uh, scrolls through very, very quickly. Um, and um, even though you can highlight uh, a message to a station, to a particular station, and that will be highlighted on their screen, it just can disappear off screen within seconds and they may not notice it. So um, in, those, in those times, you need to, uh, to uh, use a, a, another client such as KSD to me, um, where you can easily see your, the messages that are sent to you. <laughs> um, that's that was developed by Bo uh, OZ2M, and you'll need a, a license key for that. So no cost for that. Um, then there's um, one that's been uh, developed more recently by uh, ENGM3 SCK, and that combines um, uh, ON4 uh, KST. Uh, with um, Air Scout, and I will mention Air Scout in a moment, which is the aircraft scatter um, uh, client uh, uh, or app rather. So um, those are all there to uh, to help you make contacts. And that's just a, um, a view of the um, ON4 KST um, uh, microwave chat page, um, and you get um, a, a scrolling uh, message list on the left hand side. Um, I got mine set up so it gives a, um, a, a, a map of where contacts are um, uh, occurring uh, between the stations that are logged in. Um, that data comes from, KS, uh, from KST itself and from the um, uh, D, um, uh, DX um, cluster network, um, which is actually the, um, the, um, the window at the bottom with the orange highlight on it. That's uh, the output of the DX clusters got a list of who's logged on and um, you can the whole page is um, user configurable so you can um, set it up how you want it and the other thing I mentioned is Zello which um, some microwave operators are using and that's uh, a push what they call a push to talk app on your mic on your uh, on your phone um, and um, it, it works uh, works quite well so um, um, you'll often find people logged in uh, uh, chatting away on that um, I mentioned aircraft scatter, um, and um, one of the things with aircraft scatter, you will, will need to set it up with uh, some form of uh, talkback. Um, now, um, Air Scout uh, plots positions uh, of uh, aircraft in uh, near real time, uh, and also shows when a path between you and the station you wish to work, or you just set up uh, to work, uh, will be open. Um, uh, and like anything, uh, the bigger the aircraft, the better the reflections you're likely to get. However, aircraft uh, reflection duration um, can vary uh, depending on a number of um, a number of factors. There's the distance between the two stations, whether the aircraft is flying across the path or along it. Obviously, if it's not flying along it, you're going to get longer reflection times. But um, it could be as short as one minute. So you need very slick operating skills to, uh, to complete a QSO. But 
you know, a contest QSO can be completed um, on SSB um, within um, within about 20 seconds or so um, if both operators are um, uh, are observing uh, when when the when the path is open. And uh, sort of law, I always find that um, when I work um, on the aircraft scatter, um, we do the exchange. And as we as we sign, you'll watch the signal come up. Sometimes up as it's up as far as uh, S nine, whereas you've been uh, been uh, copying and when you did your contest exchanges about S one or two. But uh, that's just Sod's law. Um, this is just the picture there, Scout. Uh, um, the map shows um, um, where the aircraft are. The red uh, aircraft in the picture show potential uh, aircraft uh, sc uh, scattering. If you click on them, you can see how long. It'll be before they're in the in the path. Um, the, uh, the you may or may not be able to see uh, right in the middle. There's a, an aircraft highlighted in purple, uh, and that's the path between me and uh, John uh, up in Scotland, uh, GM4 JTJ. He's up um, north of Aberdeen there somewhere, um, and um, uh, it's a 600 kilometer path. And uh, at that time, when I took that screenshot, that path was open between me and uh, John, so we could uh, complete a um, a QSO, um, but because the aircraft is going across the path, it wouldn't be open for very long. Uh, the other thing uh, you can do, um, particularly on the six centimetres and three centimetre band, is, um, uh, is rain scatter, and it can be a, a very effective um, means of making uh, longer distance contacts out to a few hundred kilometres. Um, now, local, heavy localised storms or showers are best. Um, if you've got rain across the whole country, for instance, uh, it's not very effective. In fact, <laughs> nine times out of 10, it'll act as a, an attenuator because uh, uh, there's so much rain, it'll just scatter the signal everywhere. And obviously you can use uh, the, um, uh, the weather radar to um, uh, determine where the scatter points are. Um, looking at the map there, there's a good scatter point over um, East Anglia at the moment, and um, um, it's probably getting a bit far away, but there's um, um, a scatter point uh, down in sort of south of uh, uh, southern part of Brittany. Um, so very, very useful, and um, tend to use FM a lot on that because the signal is less distorted. Um, use SSB, um, but um, you can get distortion because of the Doppler shift, because the, the movement of the rain. Right, contest. Um, um, the um, uh, RSGB um, uh, do a number of uh, Tuesday evening contests covering VHF uh, right through to, um, to microwave bands and also of course Thursday evenings for four meters and uh, uh, six meters. Um, the um, two microwave uh, Tuesdays are the third Tuesday of the month, which is the 23 centimeter contest. And that goes from um, 20 hundred hours to 2200 hours. Um, and then on the fourth Tuesday, I was going to say the last Tuesday of the month, but it's not always the last Tuesday of the month, um, is the um, 13, 9, 6 and 3 centimeter bands. And um, that starts a little bit earlier. Um, um, 1930 to 2230. Um, there are also other RSGB uh, and um, IARU Region 1 contests uh, throughout the year that uh, cover various microwave bands. And those are tend, to, tend to be coordinated uh, events with, um, uh, with Europe. So uh, there's good potential to, uh, to work into uh, Europe with um, the um, uh, uh, with those contests, like like the the, um, the Tuesday evenings, they they are um, coordinated with uh, some of the European countries. So you you'll find France uh, uh, French stations on, and Germans, and uh, um, the the Nordic countries, and uh, uh, the Netherlands. Um, the UK Microwave Group, UG UK UG, um, also has a, a number of contests and activity periods during the year. There are uh, low band contests um, uh, covering 23 SEMs to 9 SEMs, as well as um, 6 SEMs and 3 SEMs contests held on uh, on Sundays uh, through the spring, summer and autumn. Um, and these tend to be um, 
uh, more relaxed affairs, um, particularly those of you who have operated on the uh, VHF, UHF um, uh, Tuesday evening contest. Um, they can be uh, <laughs> uh, 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 very quick affairs that have a you know, QSO lasting uh, literally seconds. Whereas um, on the, um, the Sunday ones run by the UK microwave group, um, you know, I, I, I don't mind spending 20 minutes, half an hour trying to have a contact. And if it, particularly if it's a, someone new just come onto the van and help them um, um, line up a dish or a tester system. Um, um, so, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great way to go out and test, your, test the, uh, the equipment that you've, uh, you've uh, just built. Right. Um, so where do you start? Um, well, obviously, if you've got a, a 23 SEMS transceiver, um, that's easy. Um, you just need a, an antenna and uh, off you go. Um, you might need later on uh, uh, pre-amplifiers or power amplifiers, but uh, it's a good start. So I started, I, I bought a, a second-hand um, uh, FT326 many years ago, and um, that was my 23 SEMS uh, system for, for, for a while. Um, no pre-amplifier. I didn't. Uh, I didn't do too badly, particularly when conditions were good. Um, uh, a number of people have um, setups for um, uh, uplinking 13 SEMS to the Oscar 100 satellite. Um, so if you've got that, um, why not also use that system uh, for um, uh, 13 SEMS narrowband on 2320 MHz. Um, uh, so um, that's uh, that's an option for those that got uh, that, that, that are using systems up for satellite working. Um, or alternatively, of course, there's uh, relatively affordable transverters now for um, 2313 and 9 SEMS. Um, or you, as I say, you can um, go and uh, um, build your own. Uh, but as I said earlier, you need some other bits and pieces to go with these uh, transverters. Um, or, as I said, I mentioned the FPV system, the, um, uh, the drone uh, uh, video link systems um, uh, allow you uh, local uh, FM contacts. Um, um, uh, so, um, and as I say, there are, there are quite, quite a bit of activity uh, using those systems um, in the north, uh, Northwest. Um, or you could use them. Um, an LNB with a um, SDR receiver to uh, not only listen to the satellite downlink, but also when there's activity to see what you can hear on um, terrestrial three centimeters. It wouldn't be fair if I didn't mention safety. A lot of people get worried about microwaves and microwave safety. Now, there's new license conditions that are going to come into effect uh, later this year. Um, and uh, we're all going to have to carry out a risk assessment on our stations to ensure that um, um, we don't uh, exceed um, um, uh, international guidelines on electromagnetic uh, radiation levels. Um, um, that doesn't mean that if we, if the, if we exceed the, uh, the guidelines, it doesn't mean we have to stop, this, uh, stop operating. It means we have to <laughs> put in some mitigation uh, um, um, uh, uh, compliance uh, conditions, but um, there'll be more on that uh, later on on the RSGB website. Um, uh, you need to do it for port for home and uh, portable operation. Uh, very important if you're going to operate in a, a public uh, location. I mentioned the guidelines on the RSGB website. Um, and it's never a good idea to look down a, a waveguide with a transmitter on. Um, you'll get boiled eyeballs if it's a really high power transmitter. So um, that said, um, oh, and I've just gone past, let me go up, um, sorry, missed that first page. Um, some resources, um, I realize I've gone on a little bit longer than uh, I intended, but anyway, um, uh, the UK Microwave uh, Group, um, we have a website with uh, lots of information on various microwave bands. Uh, there's a, a publication called Scatterpoint that comes out uh, every month. That's, a, that's an online um, uh, publication. Uh, we offer a free uh, chip bank to members. Um, so if you only want a few um, um, uh, chip resistors, for instance, um, 
and the uh, main suppliers would uh, charge you a minimum uh, cost of um, perhaps uh, you know or postage on an uh, order under thirty pounds. We even include the postage, so uh, it's completely free to members. Uh, UK Microwave also have loan equipment. Um, we have um, loan equipment for six centimeters and three centimeters, and for some of the higher um, uh, millimeter wave bands as well. Uh, of course, we've got members who um, who are able to offer help and advice to uh, anyone starting out in the microwave. Um, of course, we're on Twitter, Facebook, and we've got our YouTube channel, so you can watch some of the uh, uh, the uh, uh, microwave bits and pieces and operating on there. And we also support, uh, including financial support, builders of beacons. What we don't do is uh, uh, pay for the uh, running of beacons, but we will pay for uh, the hardware. If people are building build beacons, we will, we will pay for that. Um, Microwave round tables. These are uh, organised by local clubs in GGW and GGM throughout the uh, throughout usually the sort of spring, summer, and autumn months. Um, and um, uh, these uh, you'll find that there are talks, construction comp competition, and access to uh, test gear at many of them. And uh, there'll be surplus components and uh, equipment uh, for sale. Um, obviously, now we can't. Uh, hold round tables, but hopefully, uh, if not later this year, um, hopefully they re resume in 2000, uh, 2022. Um, there's also UK Microwave uh, Groups IO uh, online forum, um, that's moderated by Andy G4JNT, and there are regular postings and discussions on mainly microwave topics. And of course, there's the RSGB website, it's got band plans, beacon list information on microwaves. Um, um, contest groups, if you're thinking about you want to go and uh, operate um, uh, portable uh, like uh, some of the contest groups do, um, why not look at the UK uh, AC um, web pages and the resorts and see what other people in your area are doing, what equipment they have. If you look at the resorts of the, um, the UK uh, contest, uh, you can click on and see what, what equipment people are using. Um, you could even make contact with uh, a group or individual and say, hey, can I come and uh, see what you do when you go out portable? Um, that will give you an idea uh, of what, what kit you might need and whether that whether portable operation appeals to you. There's the British Amateur Tele Television Cl Cl Club that um, has some, um, besides microwave uh, TV, also has uh, some uh, microwave uh, related products, uh, projects rather, and information. There's AMSAT UK with Oscar 13 uh, uplink and 3 downlink information. Um, and um, uh, uh, back in November, um, and I hope I'm not, uh, uh, that doesn't come out right. <laughs> uh, the, the virtual screen didn't, uh, didn't allow me to do that. Um, uh, Practical Wireless uh, published a, uh, an article by Ben uh, G4 BXD um, starting on microwave. So if you want to uh, read a uh, uh, someone's uh, an individual's account of how he got going on uh, microwaves uh, fairly recently, uh, then you can uh, go and have a look at that uh, issue of practical wireless. And um, finally, there's some web addresses that um, uh, you'll find lots of information. There's lots of links on the, um, the UK Microwave uh, Group uh, uh, website. So uh, these are just the, some of the ones that I've, uh, um, uh, information I've mentioned as we've gone along. So thank you very much for uh, for watching. As I say, it's gone on a little longer than uh, I had intended. Um, so um, I'm handing you back to uh, to David. That's not a problem at all, Neil. Thank you very much indeed for what a what a great talk. Um, you mentioned lots of resources then, of course, and lots of links and things, and we'll be putting a lot of those links as well on the uh, RSGB YouTube page where you'll be able to watch this again later. Uh, but also, as she mentions, there's a couple of really good um, RSGB books available. Uh, you can see them there. Microwave Know-How and a Microwave Handbook are just a couple of the books and you can get those from rsgb.org forward slash shop as well. So uh, that's another way of uh, getting to know how to get started anyway. So uh, if you'd like to ask a question and haven't already done so, 
Please do it now on either YouTube chat or BATC messaging. And please don't forget to include your first name and your call sign if you have one. So we've got some questions for you, Neil. And uh, the first one that I saw comes from um, Andy, 2E0REE, and he asks, where is the best place to get plans for 23 centimeter antennas and higher up the bands? Right, you can um, um, obviously go to our uh, website, uh, www.microwavers.org. Um, there'll be some information on there. But um, um, I, I guess I'd say that, um, you know, a great resource. I mean, it, we didn't have it when I started on microwaves, but, um, you know, the internet, um, you can Google um, uh, 23 SEMS antennas and you can... Um, um, uh, you can get lots of information online. There's lots of uh, there's information in the books that David has just um, pointed out. Um, and um, there are um, um, some designs uh, that have been published in past years on Scatterpoint. Um, our online magazine is, um, um, is available to members only uh, until, um, and then we release it uh, to, uh, to everyone after I think two years. So the, uh, um, the the 19 uh, sorry the 2019 scatter points uh, have all been um, recently released uh, and are available through our website and um, you might uh, find uh, I'm not sure how far they go back but there may be designs in there I, I can't um, specifically put my finger on one I hope I hope I've answered that question yes that's fine thanks very much Neil uh, we've got another question now on BATC this time from Brian G1 UFA and says, have C4 FM, D Star, and DMR digital modes been used on 13 centimeters and 23 centimeters and above? Um, yeah, we're, um, I mean, I, uh, they are being used, the digital modes, uh, on all the microwave bands. Uh, I've operated, that's another thing I do is, is TV um, and digital TV. I built the, um, the ports down uh, and the uh, mini tuner that's, uh, that that um, allow you to operate on the, the microwave bands uh, or on any on any band on digital TV, um, and they're used on all the bands. In fact, um, uh, I uh, I together with Noel G4 GTZ um, hold the world record on digital amateur television on the 76 gigahertz band. Wow! So um, uh, so how far yeah. was that then, Neil? How far did you work uh, with Noel? Um, we did, um, um, we did, uh, th uh, was it 35, um, yeah, 35 uh, kilometers, I think that was. With what sort um, of we, power? Um, about, uh, from me, uh, from me, it was um, um, about 15 milliwatts and with Noel about 5 milliwatts. Um, so that sounds to me want... that that's one of the most extraordinary things, isn't it? It's the really small amounts of power. I know you can go QRP and work a long way with all of the propagation and everything is for you with HF, but to work those with just a few milliwatts, that seems extraordinary to me to be able to do that. Yeah, especially when uh, you think that the all the energy in, that you transmit is not in a very narrow band, it, it's spread out <laughs> across mm. uh, um, a fair bit of bandwidth. We've even done a full... Uh, full uh, high definition television, but uh, only over about 25 uh, kilometers. But even, and that's still with milliwatts, is it? Yeah, same same equipment. Uh, that was milliwatts, yeah. Extraordinary. So BATC would be a good place to go and get more information about that, I guess. Yes, indeed. Um, another question for you. Um, I don't have a name, but I, I got a, a call sign earlier, G1FBH, maybe you know them. Uh, they've got, they're down as Canna Video Productions, but uh, he or she says, SG Labs do a nice linear 25 watt output for 1.5 watts in 12.8 volts for full output. Built in 10 dB receive preamp as well and about 170 pounds. So uh, that's a tip there. Yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the one I showed on the, uh, the slide. Great. And uh, Brian also has another couple of uh, questions. Where's the best place to get microwave components, waveguides, FE isolators and things like that? Right, probably the um, the best uh, place has always been uh, micro the microwave round tables. Um, does vary from round table to round table. Um, the one that's really good is the one that's held at the BT Research Labs uh, near Ipswich. Um, but um, failing that, um, you can uh, there's lots of um, people who um, have been at uh, uh, been <laughs> in the microwave. Uh, uh, 
uh, game for uh, quite a few number of years, and they've probably got bits of um, uh, uh, microwave uh, uh, waveguide lying around. So um, if you were to um, go on to um, the, um, the um, um, uh, Groups IO uh, site, um, our microwave uh, chat there, um, you ask there, um, you may well find that uh, people will offer you uh, bits and pieces. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's another good resource. To, yes, uh, I, I guess yeah, we're all yeah. missing radio rallies and things at this time. And uh, yeah. although there are auctions, auction sites and things, you do seem to pay quite a lot of money on some of those anyway. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I think uh, you know, when I started, uh, things were relatively cheap if you could get them. Um, uh, but I think people now uh, sort of um, do inflate the prices a lot because uh, uh, things are in short supply. Mm. Indeed. Uh, Brian also says, has anyone done an experimental work with electronically steerable microwave antennas? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's an interesting one. Um, uh, it's, I guess, where the amateur community is sort of lagging behind the the um, uh, uh, the uh, commercial, the professional people. Um, one of the um, uh, I, I'm not sure um, uh, how uh, how some of these uh, steerable uh, antennas, um, electronically steerable antennas. Um, be, behave on transmit. They're, I mean, I can see they work well on uh, on receive, but um, I think um, you might be very limited in the amount of power you can transmit into them. Um, um, uh, I, I'm not not ab absolutely sure, but I'm, I'm not aware of anybody doing that. But I know it's it's uh, it's something that's uh, it's um, used uh, a fair bit in the commercial world. So waiting for someone to do that in the amateur world as well, then. Uh, Jeff on 8 nt says the influence of trees question mark summer or winter what's best um, trees are a problem on the certainly as you go uh, up in um, frequency um, I uh, I I've got here um, trees to my west uh, and only about um, uh, on uh, uh, along the edge of the, the lane so um, probably about um, 30 meters from the uh, the antennas and um, going that way though um, though, though, though um, the uh, systems at 60 foot above the ground level the uh, some of the trees are about 80 or 90 feet tall at the moment so um, uh, in the summer months that can have an effect on the higher frequencies um, um, so um, you do really need to <laughs> keep a, a, a far away from trees as possible uh, uh, my comment about um, trying to find suitable hilltops that don't have trees on them. Um, not such not such a problem on 23 SEMs, but um, you know, as the clearer takeoff uh, you have, the the better on any microwave band. So the higher the frequency, generally the less tolerant they are of things like objects in the way. Yes, that that's that's true. Although um, with my uh, tire wound down, I get leaf scatter in the summer um, <laughs> by elevating my dish to look at the top of the trees, I can actually receive the, um, the Bell Hill beacons, the, the, the beacon I showed, um, showed you and uh, played, played the um, clip. Um, uh, with, with, the, uh, with the antenna down, it's, it's, um, uh, uh, the, I don't get a, a, a signal from the, from the beacon, but if I elevate the dish says so it's looking at the tops of the trees, I actually get scatter off the tops of the trees. So, uh, um, but um, the video that you problem. played with your Pluto with just a little tiny like a dipole that you'd made effectively at the back of it, it looked like to me anyway. Um, you know, how, what sort of range would you get with something like that? Um, not very far. That, that actually isn't a dipole. OK, it's, uh, it's two separate antennas, one on transmit, and one on ah, receive. Okay. Two, two, little, two little stubby antennas that are supplied with the uh, Pluto. Um, so um, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect to get to get very far. Obviously, um, I can work the Isle of Wight because there's very little in the way between me and the Isle of Wight. And you're um, in Salisbury, I think, aren't you? Well, I'm I'm Near. west. Uh, sorry, I'm east of Salisbury uh, on high ground. So uh, actually, if I walk um, a little way from the house, um, I can actually see the Isle of Wight uh, line of sight. Literally, I can see it. Okay, that's great. Um, we've got a, another question here from uh, Vince G1 FBH who says, "What power do you call QRP and QRO transmit power or antenna ERP?" He says. 
And also, by the way, referring that was referring to 23 centimetres for that question. Right. Um, well, um, I guess you'd have to sort of, uh, I mean, QRP to one person is sort of QRO to somebody else, mm -hmm. I suppose. Difficult to say, but if you're running milliwatts or a, or a, a few watts, I think um, in the um, uh, uh, RSGB Tuesday contest, I can't remember, I think um, uh, low power is under 50 watts for 23 sems, if I'm correct. Um, um, maybe 100 watts, I don't know, but I wouldn't call 100 watts QRP. So I would say a, um, a, a few watts. Yeah. And obviously, um, uh, that's that's input power. But obviously, if you've got a you've got a, an antenna with a gain of you know, 20, uh, 20 dBs, which is um, uh, easily achievable on 23 sems, um, you, you're, you're, you're going to have um, a, a, an ERP of several hundred uh, watts, even with a, a watt uh, 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 what or so input. Um, if you go up to dishes, um, um, you know, really big dishes uh, um, on on the the, uh, the higher bands, then uh, you know you can you can get to uh, hundreds of kilowatts of ERIP. Um, can I, can I just ask you, as someone who just looked at micros but not really know much, and probably a lot of people watching might be in the same sort of position. When you have a larger dish, does that allow you to give more power? Does it more better focus or more directional or what? What are the benefits of having a larger dish? Well, the, the benefits of having a larger dish are most of those. Um, uh, it means you've got higher gain. So you've got more power going in the direction you want it to go. But it does mean, of course, that your beam width becomes narrower. Mm. So, you know, um, um, a big dish on three centimetres might only have um, a band width, uh, a bit, sorry, a beam width of um, um, three or four degrees, um, uh, which means you have to be uh, uh, very accurate at pointing at the uh, station you want to um, uh, to work. You know, if you move the dish a few degrees, then you lose the signal. Um, and also, of course, the bigger the dish, um, the, uh, the the um, the better your receive signal is going to be, because uh, it's you know acting as a <laughs> as a uh, if you like an amplifier of the received signal, so there's more signal coming in uh, to your antenna, um, and um, uh, so you are going to work, be able to work uh, stations who are further away or stations who are running um, much lower power with a bigger antenna. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got Stuart G1ZAR says, "Do you need aerial aer sorry aerial elevation to work aircraft scatter?" Um, I. Well, one of the um, reasons for using aircraft scatter is it's because you're, you're not trying to work somebody usually just down the road. You're trying to work somebody hundreds of kilometers away. Now, um, the, uh, the fact is that um, when uh, an aircraft is, uh, you know, if, if, if for instance, uh, the, the, um, the path I, I showed on uh, Air Scout to working John up in uh, Scotland, uh, um, that's a 600 uh, kilometer path. The aircraft, in order for me to work in the aircraft have to be in the middle of the path, so they're about 300 um, kilometers from me. Um, so um, uh, in that case, the, uh, the aircraft is appearing just over the horizon as far as I'm, as far as my antenna is concerned. So I don't use any elevation on the, on the, uh, 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 when I'm um, uh, working uh, aircraft scatter. So uh, it is beaming up the horizon. Mm, great, thank you. We're getting towards the end of our presentation and questions now. We've got another question though from Brian G1 UFA. He says, "What's the best microwave frequencies for EME, Earth, Moon, Earth?" Um, there's a lot of um, there's a um, lot of activity on 23 SEMs. Um, besides people running dishes and high power, there are people running digital modes with um, with single Yagi's or. Um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, bait or um, uh, box uh, of Yagi's, so four Yagi's phased together. Um, um, so that's relatively easy to do with um, relatively low power. Um, so 23 SEMS is, um, is quite popular, um, um, but there's activity on all the, um, the microwave bands that I, I've talked about to, tonight, but that does tend to be um, um, be at, at various activity times or contests during the year. Um, there is some some random uh, EME, um, but um, um, the problem with 13 SEMS is that um, um, 
not all countries have the same allocation. A lot of countries have lost their 13 SEMS allocation. Um, some countries in Europe have lost it. Um, uh, so um, uh, you need to have a, a, a transverter that can operate on the, um, um, the other segments of um, 13 SEMS that um, other countries like Australia or, the, or North America has, uh, or at least receive on, the, on those frequencies. But um, and it's, there's a reasonable amount of um, activity on, on um, three SEMS, but again, that tends to be focused around activity periods and contests. Mm. Sounds wonderful. And by the way, when you mentioned the low cost test equipment earlier on, I, I agree. I mean, it, it wasn't that many years ago when I, the thought of owning a spectrum analyzer would have been impossible. Um, but now you can buy something from about fifty pounds or so, can't you, for some basic ones? At least to, s to be able to see these sort of frequencies. And you did mention as well that we had a talk coming up. So it's worth mentioning that uh, tonight at eight, actually not next month, but on the twelfth uh, of April, we have a talk from Alan W two A E W on VNAs and the Nano VA VNA, as you said. So that that'll be really useful uh, to find out about that sort of low cost test equipment that you can get now. Uh, Neil, it's been a fantastic evening. Um, you've covered a lot, a big subject. I, th I hope that you've uh, managed, and I feel you've managed to, to dispel the fears of microwaves uh, as well, and that uh, a lot of us could begin to experiment with them. So we'd like to thank you very much indeed for tonight's presentation. Okay, David, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to, uh, to talk. And um, don't forget, uh, if you uh, need advice or help, there's a lot out there. Um, Breast Porter Core is probably the uh, UK microwave group. Um, and you can join that. It's just six pounds a year. <laughs> Sorry about the ad. No, not but... at all. It's good. <laughs> we'll make sure we put links as well um, to accompany yeah. this, uh, your talk yeah. as well yeah. on the uh, YouTube recording of this. So once again, Neil, thank you very much. Thank you and uh, good night to everyone. Thank you. And that does conclude this webinar. And uh, thanks once again to our guest presenter, Neil Underwood, G4 DL, uh, L LDR. We hope that you've enjoyed this tonight at 8 and that you'll join us next time when we'll be looking at the latest propagation prediction tools with Steve Nichols, G0KYA. Now, if you'd like to see details of that and other webinars or to send any comments or feedback, please visit www.rsgb.org forward slash webinars. And remember, if you subscribe to the RSGB's YouTube channel, you'll be notified of all upcoming Tonight at 8 webinars, as well as other new videos and presentations from the Society on a wide range of amateur radio topics. But until next time, this is David G7ERP, signing off and clear. Bye-bye.